uh, we can do together, right? <clears throat> Namo tatsa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tatsa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tatsa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Okay, good evening everyone and uh, thank you for having me here. The title of the talk this tonight, Nama Rupa, the middle road between materialism and idealism. This was one of many topics that I gave to the Buddhist fellowship and somehow it got put over here. So you've picked the most complicated topic that I have uh, to talk about and I'm not sure everybody how familiar you are with uh, the Buddhist teachings. So we're going to have to kind of find our way through. I don't want to get too complicated and use too many technical terms uh, if people aren't understanding them. And at the same time, I don't want to use technical terms because some of them, some of you will understand them better than I do and then you'll realize all my mistakes. <laughs> so, uh, just to show of hands, dependent origination, the basic 12 link formula of dependent origination, is everybody fairly familiar with? Raise your hand if you have no idea. Uh, so, some do, some don't. So, we're right in the middle. Okay. Uh, I also realize that the title of this involves philosophy and philosophical positions, but my own position is not of a philosopher. Actually, I'm a psychologist, not a philosopher. So, we will, what I want to do then is to give the whole picture of this teaching. And you'll see why, but uh, in short, there are two ways to understand something. One is you can start to, you can look at all the individual elements of something and try to put it together and get the big picture. That's one way to try and work things out. The other way to work things out is to understand the big picture first and that will contextualize all the individual parts. So if we're looking at a human being, and I said, okay, you've got a liver and a heart and a blood system and an endocrine system and a skeletal system and a brain system, a central nervous system, and senses come in, they get churned around, and behavior is outputted. Does this really describe a human being? In a way, yes, but the other way to do it is we can talk about, well, this is a human being and we have likes and desires and wants and we grow old and we, grow and we die. And that will contextualize what the liver is for, the heart is for, and the blood is for, etc. So in this presentation of dependent origination, uh, by the way, do feel free to interrupt if you have a question, or especially if I mention something and you want to see it written down, uh, or you want to have it explained, then do in interrupt. You'll get more out of me if you interact than if you just sit quietly. Um, so I do like to write down technical terms for people who are maybe not familiar. I'm very happy to do non-technical talks too, but this is the one that you picked or they picked for you, so uh, this is how we're going to proceed this evening. Um, okay, to make it uh, easier, what I should say is 
Some years ago, about 20 years ago, there was a large CD-ROM project in Bangkok in the days when CD-ROMs were all the rage. Now nobody cares, but uh, CD-ROM project, and we were doing the life of the Buddha by using the murals and the paintings in Thai temples. And the light from the Buddha from before he was born to enlightenment is easy. From enlightenment to after he died is fairly easy. There's lots of nice pictures and images. But in between these two we had Dharma. And Dharma was a lot harder to visualize on a CD-ROM as multimedia. And so one of the pictures was the picture I was showing just briefly on the screen a few minutes ago was this picture of a big wheel with 12 compartments going around it and it's called the wheel of becoming or dependent origination. And the director of the multimedia project, he loved this picture, he loves pictures and art and so he'd, he'd made this wheel in three dimensions in the computer. And what you do is on each of the links, each of the parts as you go around, and I will show you this picture later, just for those who aren't familiar with it. You are able to fly in in three dimensions and go into that philosophical con concept. And then in the, that little room, we would have little videos and texts and different things that would describe each one of these links. Uh, these links, by the way, which I've written up on the board, I've used a couple of alternative translations, but you'll see why I've done that. So, um, what he asked me to do was to put in, in the entire three CD-ROMs that we did, in fact, every single part uh, had to have a visual image, let's say the Buddha's birthplace, you click on it and you jump to Lumpini and you can see the, the area in modern day, you can zoom above it. Every single part of the entire uh, CDs had to have links to the original suttas, the original text. So we were very clear that we wanted to do this. One reason for academic completeness, and the other reason is if anybody starts to criticize us, we can say, look, we've got the actual sutta quotation reference, so nobody can argue. So I had to write, find these definitions for each of these terms. Now. This particular teaching is one of the most confused and misunderstood teachings in the whole of Buddhism. There are a number of different interpretations and every teacher that you meet is going to say, no, 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 they're all wrong, I'll tell you how it is. And so it gets very confused. I do accept that there are different interpretations. Uh, I'm here this evening so you get my interpretation. Um, but there are many alternatives. Uh, interpretations. So I wasn't confident enough of my interpretation to write down the definitions of each of these links. So what I did was I looked each of them up in the suttas themselves. Those who don't know, the Pali suttas are the closest that we have to the actual words of the Buddha. It might not be the exact words that the Buddha used, but they are the exact words that people after the Buddha said that he used. So after the Buddha passed away, the scriptures or the teachings were brought together uh, and agreed upon and formalized, uh, tabulated, uh, made into chants, distributed, and then that's how the monks would do the recitations. Recitation, by the way, is considered to be a far superior record-keeping method than the other two record-keeping methods, which were writing things down and using story. Each of these three methods has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, if you like, make a note. We can talk about that later on. So the teachings were uh, recorded in this way by recitation. It's an extremely powerful uh, way that is not prone to corruption in the way that writing and storytelling is. So, the, this is how the teaching comes down to us and usually for dependent origination is presented as having 12 links. 
When I went into the suttas, I wanted to find out what were the actual original definitions for each of these terms. Because after the suttas came the commentarial tradition, and that really is what I think Theravada Buddhism is. It's an interpretation based on the comment certain commentaries. So even Theravada Buddhism has come quite a long way from original Buddhism. But I would say that the Pali Buddhism, even Mahayana, tend to agree that the Pali scriptures are the closest that we can get to the original teachings of the Buddha. We can't get any closer than that. So I went to the Pali uh, scriptures and I pulled out the definitions for each one. And I realized that the way that most people teach it or understand it is a little bit confused when you look at the original definitions, which were fairly clear, most of them. Some of them, a bit unclear still. So after that, I uh, put this document together and I thought, you know, I've got a pretty good idea what it means going from the original. And then some years later, I did a degree in psychology and I fell in love with a very old school of psychology called Gestalt. Does anybody know Gestalt? Not Gestalt therapy. Not Gestalt therapy. I love psychology. I have no interest in therapy. Like, you have problems, I'm not the person to come and talk to. Uh, giving therapy is what in psychology is called counseling. And counseling is 100% not my field of expertise. Uh, what I like actually is cognitive science. So uh, the early school of Gestalt was a cognitive science-based uh, approach. In Gestalt, the idea is originally there was two main ways to investigate psychology in the early psychological schools. The first way was to examine behavior. So we can understand psychology by looking at what you do. If you look at it this way, you have the world, you have the senses, you have behavior. Unfortunately, I just spelt that the American way. I don't know why I did that. <clears throat> I'm a bit ashamed of that now. So what we want to know in psychology is why do people act differently? So why do some people come and sit on the front row and some people like to sit right at the back and hide away? This is difference in behavior. Why? Some people are very angry or violent. Some people are very peaceful and friendly. Uh, people change from when they're very young to as they get older, they change in their behavior. So psychology is primarily actually interested in this word here, behavior. But the question is, why is behavior different for different people? And this is what the psychologists wanted to figure out. So what we say is, if you start here, we all kind of have a roughly, live in roughly the same world. Maybe different according to your country or your class. Uh, you have less traffic in Singapore than we have in Bangkok. But roughly speaking, we live in a similar kind of environment. Uh, this environment is sensed through our senses. In Buddhism, six senses. In psychology, anything between eight and 20 different senses. You have quite a lot of senses you don't know about, but you use. So this roughly the same. The person sitting at the front here and the person sitting at the back, you have different behavior, but you're in the same environment. You have roughly the same senses. So why is the behavior different? In here, we're going to put a black box and call it the psyche. 
And what psychology wants to do is to find some kind of model to put in here where we can explain why behavior is different. So there are a lot of different schools of, of psychology that have different models that they will put in here. And some more successful than others. Original psychology then had two main approaches. One was to study, forget about this, forget even about the psyche, we just want to look at your behavior. And so a lot of this psychology was done testing on animals. Rats, cats, you may know Pavlov and his dogs, right? Uh, Pav Pavlov actually was a physiologist, he wasn't a psychologist. And he was studying how much saliva a dog's uh, saliva gland makes in response to food. And it was only by total accident that he stumbled on what is now known as classical conditioning. Um, when he noticed that the dog's saliva would come out even when it didn't get food, if it just expected food or had some signal of food. So a lot of experiments were done on animals. But the other school of psychology said, no, we can't experiment on animals to find out about human beings. We have to ask the human beings. You're the one that experiences your psyche, right? So why don't we just ask you? Why did you sit at the front? Why did you sit at the back? Why is this person violent and that person friendly? Why does this person like to read books and that person likes to play football? I can't imagine why anybody would like to play football personally, but something gone wrong in this area, I think. And cricket, don't get me started on cricket. I know I'm in a Sri Lankan place here, so I have to be careful if I talk about cricket. So, the, this school of psychology said, we ask you what's going on. We ask you to describe. The problem is, when we ask you to describe what's going on in your mind, you're going to say what you think has happened, what you think about the world, and not be able to actually explain your behavior. A lot of your behavior is actually influenced by things that you don't even know about. For example, there's a, a cunning test that psychologists like to do. Uh, we won't do it, but I think you can grasp the principle. If we split the room into two halves and I give you a story to read, a funny story, short story, and after reading the story, you give it marks from one to 10 how funny you think the story was. But on this side of the room, I'm going to ask, uh, we won't do it, just imagine, I will ask you to read the story, but hold a pen in your teeth while you read it. And this side, I'm going to ask you to read the story, but hold a pen in your mouth while you read it. Which side will find the story more funny? What do you think? Raise your hand if you think it makes no difference whatsoever whether you have a pen in your mouth. A few people, okay? Raise your hand if you think the pen in the teeth will find it funnier. Raise your hand if you think pen in the mouth will find it funnier. Okay. So it was rough, roughly like Nobody has a clue, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly the same number of people for each answer. The correct answer is the people that hold the pen in the teeth will find the story much funnier than the people who hold the pen in the mouth. And the reason should be quite obvious when I demonstrate it. Holding a pen in the teeth, holding a pen in the mouth, Sorry for... <laughs> so, this shows that something that you don't take any account of actually can have a big influence on your behavior. And this is the problem if you ask people to describe why they did what they did. Actually, most of the time, you have no idea why you did what you did. There's a cute story that comes, I'm not quite sure how true it is, but um, that Freud originally, when he was young, he went to see, and this is 100% true, he went to see a French mesmer, which you would know as a hypnotist. And the hypnotist had got people up on the stage and has said to one woman, 
When the clock rings two o'clock, you will open a window. And then he moved on to the other people on the stage and some of them had to pretend they were carrots and blah, 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 whatever it is hypnotism, hypnotists do. And then the subjects were told to sit down and the show went on. And then at two o'clock, the clock rang and that woman got up and closed the window. Did I say close or open? Open. So she got up and opened the window. So this... Freud thought was really interesting because this is behavior of that woman and when he asked her why did you open the window actually the mesmerist asked her why did you open the window she said oh it's a bit stuffy it's a bit hot so the point is she had a behavior that she had no idea of the proper explanation for and this should be quite scary because you think you're in control you think you govern your behavior Actually, a lot of your behavior may well be coming from things you have no idea about. Your hormones govern your behavior. Your society governs your behavior. Hidden influences you can't see govern your behavior. So there was a third school of psychology that came up that was less popular than the, the two that I've just described. And instead of looking at behavior and instead of looking at self-reporting, what they wanted to do was find out what you actually experience. Not what you think you experience, but what you actually experience. So the whole realm of Gestalt here is what you actually experience. For example, there was one report of a person who said that they experienced an angel come down and uh, give them teachings from God. And when they pushed this subject further, what they actually experienced was blue and a, and a euphoria. So the way that they had ex experienced it, but the way they described it was different. So what the Gestalt guys want to do is they want to know your experience. This all comes from a teacher, the most famous, the most influential philosopher that you will never have heard of. And his name is Franz Brentano. If you want to look him up. Franz Brentano. He's a... A rather cantankerous figure, I think he was Italian or certainly he lived in Italy uh, and he influenced, he taught Freud, he taught Max Wertheimer who invented the Gestalt, he taught Edmund Husserl who uh, brought in phenomenology, he um, taught William James who went and wrote some of the classic early psychological texts. He was hugely influential uh, he taught Ehrenfeld and a whole bunch of people, uh, early psychologists and philosophers. So this uh, school of Gestalt is also known as phenomenology. But if you study phenomenology in philosophy, you need a decade, you need a very good brain, and you need, you, I think you need to be a bit nuts, to be honest. It's a horrifically complicated thing. You can get a, some nice books that summarize it. I would stick there. I wouldn't go into the original texts. Uh, but the principle of this word phenomenology means what is phenomenologically present to consciousness. Right? Not what you think is happening, not what you do, but what is actually presented to consciousness. So Gestalt is the same, but it was studied in psychology rather than philosophy. And in psychology, things make a lot more sense. They're a lot easier. I might be a little biased in that one, but... So, the question is, what actually is presented to consciousness? And I use this word specifically, presented, or presentation. And what will happen is... You will have your senses bringing in inf information. You'll have your brain processing information. You'll have your uh, society 
giving you predispositions to certain things. You'll have your memory, you'll have your learning, you'll have your parents in there. All of this huge mass of influences coming in. But what you actually experience is a presentation of a thing. I'm going to say thing here, but it will get very technical of what a thing actually is. So, moment to moment, your experience as a human being is you are experiencing some thing. So, for example, if I look at the cabinet here, you can see this as a thing, right? A cabinet, right? Is that one thing or many things? It's kind of one thing if you think of it as one thing. But if you think of it another way, you say, well, that's a lower and an upper, a left and a right. So there's four bits. And if you look a bit harder, you might say, well, there's the wooden bit and the glass bit. Then you might say, well, there's the wooden bit, the glass bit and the contents. What are the contents? You say, well, it's a cup cabinet. You've been winning cricket competitions or something up here. Or you might say it's a book cabinet, or over there it looks like some thesis, like what you do when you print, print your thesis up, which I just did two weeks ago. So what is it? Is it one thing or many things? The fact is that when you look at it first, it's going to organize and present to you as one thing, a cabinet. Then you can break up that object and pick a different object, the glass and the wood. Or you can break that up and pick a different object, the clock in the cabinet. So what's happening in your mind is, not in your mind, in your experience, is that one thing will be presented to you, and then another thing, and then another thing, and then another thing. And this thing, I'm going to start using the word object. And the object would always present as a whole, as a complete object. So, for example, this table, or this table here, has a top, has four legs. You might argue it has two legs, but for the ease of conversation, it has a top, four legs. It also has a certain size, right, to be a table. It can't be that big. It can't be that big. So there's a certain size involved. There's also a quality of flatness, right? If it's not flat, it's not really going to be a table, is it? It also has a sense of completeness, because if it has holes in the top, it's not really going to be a table. So is it one thing or many things? The fact is that when you look at it, you make the table into one thing, a table, one object. You turned it into an object. And conscious, the conscious mind is only conscious of the object it's looking at. If it doesn't look at it and make it conscious, you'll never know the things that aren't presented to you. What that means is, when you're looking at the table, you are not hearing the traffic outside. You would have to turn your attention to the traffic outside to make that the thing that's presented to you. Can you look at the table that you're at now and hear the traffic at the same time? Try it. Look at your table and have the traffic. What is the experience in the mind? It's two things. You can't do it together. You have to flip, right? Now, some people say they can hold two things in the mind at the same time. Before you admit to that, that makes you a schizophrenic. So, uh, Try this. The table, the traffic, and the feelings in your big toe. Can you do it? Can you feel the feelings in your big toe? Do that now. You might need to press your toe on the floor a little bit. While you can feel your big toe, can you taste the taste in your mouth? Right? So what's happening is your attention will move around and will pick up one object. What before I called a thing, but now I'm going to call an object. And that object is a presentation to the mind. Because it's pre-organized and then, boom, that's what you experience. 
So the word organization is very important in Gestalt. And if you don't organize something and pick it out as an object, you'll never really know that particular thing. So we're going to do a little experiment here. I want all of you, just for a min minute, to close your eyes now. Close your eyes. No peeking. I've got my eyes on you. No peeking. Don't worry, I'm not going to pull out my water pistol. Close your eyes, please. Now, I want you to... Oh, we can do this way. Okay, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Uh, what's changed? Huh? The bag. Okay. Anybody else notice that? Raise your hand if you think you know what color my bag was. Most people have no idea what color my... You've been sat there for 20 minutes looking at my bag and you have no idea. What color do you think it was? Same color as my robe. No. Green, green. Okay, so the bag was green. Just for proof, here we go. Now, why is it you've been looking at this right there, but you have no idea that it was there, right? Because you're making the object that's presented to you is me. And the only reason you'll know the green is because you had looked at this and it had organized and presented this object to you at some point. That's the way that you noticed it. I could ask you what's, what's on the front of the bag, couldn't I? <laughs> So this process of consciousness means that one thing at a time, out of all your senses, all organized in the mind with your past and your parents and your society and your senses, and you see what happens when the phone goes, is that then becomes the object of your consciousness, right? Just for a moment. And this is actually important, that uh, things can push their way into your consciousness or you can choose, so it's a top-down or a bottom-up. If you want to know about this, this is the theory of attention, or what in Gestalt is called attitude. So, one thing at a time is presented to you as an object, right? And then you jump from object to object to object fairly quickly. And this seems like a rather clumsy way of an animal to behave in the world, but it's fairly effective. Generally speaking, the mind will organize things into objects that are useful for you. There are certain things that we can do to trick your system. So we can trick you into seeing objects that don't exist, and we can trick you into not seeing objects that do exist. There's a great experiment actually on this. Uh, as with everything, if you, you can prove it, uh, the one place where you can prove anything in the universe, YouTube, and they had a test where people would come in and sign up for a psychology experiment. And they always do this on students because students will do anything for five dollars. And the students come in to sign up for the test. And they come in and they see a young man standing behind a counter. They say, I've come in to sign up for the test. He said, oh, just a minute, I'll get you the form. He ducks down behind the table and then a different man will stand up and say, here's the form, just fill it out and take a seat over there. Do you think you would notice? If the man was, first man was five foot and then second man was seven foot, or the first man was uh, 150 pounds and the second man was 300 pounds, you'd probably notice. But the way they do the experiment is the first guy wore a green shirt, the other guy wore a blue shirt. This guy wore thick glasses, this guy wore thinner glasses. So they're roughly similar. If you switch it from male to female, do you think you'd notice? A lot more people would notice. Look on YouTube, it's been done. People don't notice a lot of the time. They even did this with a, a guy would go and ask somebody on the street, do you know where the museum is? And just as they're being answered, a big sheet would be two guys with a big sheet would walk past and they kind of duck out the way. And of course what they do is they switch the person. 
They can even switch it from a white person to a black person. And half the time, the person they're talking to doesn't notice. It's amazing. It's, this is all on uh, YouTube. What's his name? David somebody or other. David Blaine, is it? Does these things. So, the process of an object being presented, one object after another object after another object, is fairly, useful, is fairly practical. Human beings, well, animals work in this way. Gestalt has been done on animals just as much as human beings. When we look at Buddhism, we see the same, exact same process. And what the Buddha said was, consciousness arises as one thing and ceases as another. Just like a monkey swinging through the forest, grabs hold of one branch, lets go, grabs hold of another branch, lets go, grabs hold of another branch. And this teaching is misunderstood by people who think when they meditate, like, oh, my mind's jumping around because I'm too busy. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying everybody who has a conscious system is going to be in this kind of process. No matter how busy you are, no matter how serene you are, your mind is continually going to be showing one presentation, another presentation, or put another way, present one object, drop that, present another object, drop that, present another object. Which is you here now, paying attention to outside, paying attention to my bag, paying attention to my voice, paying attention to the person behind you whose phone just went off, paying attention to your ear which just got itchy, your mind jumping from one thing to another thing. And interestingly, the Buddha said, it's easy to see that your body is impermanent because it lives for a hundred years, fed on rice and gruel, gets old, gets sick, stoops over, the teeth turn yellow, the back becomes crooked as a roof rafter, and then you die. He said, so it's easy for people to understand their body is impermanent. But very difficult for people to understand that consciousness is impermanent. What that means is this process of one presentation after another presentation after another presentation. Everybody clear so far? Nobody interrupted me yet, said, Bante, back up. What was that? Okay. So, uh, where we come across this teaching in Buddhism, the Buddha had several different methods. And I would say not just the Buddha, but Indian philosophy in general had several methods for uh, talking about things. So, one method for talking about things. I want to give an example of a Toyota. And if we say, what is a Toyota? It's a car, but we need a bit more than that. We want to examine Toyota, Toyotaness. So, Toyota have a four-cylinder engine, small four-cylinder engine, a large four-cylinder engine, a six-cylinder engine. They have a diesel engine, right? So, let's say they have a total of about six different engines. They have a number of different chassis. Chassis is the shape of the car, Toyota Yaris, a Toyota Vios, Toyota Corolla. They probably have a little Jeep of some kind, I assume. These are a different chassis. They we have 16 different kinds of wheel. The large wheel, a smaller wheel, a fatter wheel, a thinner wheel, a light wheel, an alloy wheel, a Jeep wheel. They have some different kinds of interior. They have the uh, leather interior, fake leather interior, velour interior, walnut interior. So we can talk about Toyotas and break it down into what I'm going to call elements. That's one way to break something down. Might not be the best way, depends what we're trying to do. If I break you down, a human being, According to Buddhism, you have 32 parts of the body, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails to skin, uh, flesh, push, pus, uh, phlegm, bones, sinew, uh, bladder, etc., etc. Traditional breakdown in Buddhism, 32 parts of the body, uh, but the sutras do actually say, or anything else that you can find in a body. 
So that's an elemental breakdown, and you find a lot of that in Buddhism. It has a certain benefit, but there's another way to look at a Toyota, because nine engines, 62 wheels, five chassis, six, 14 different kinds of interior, you've never seen a Toyota like that, have you? You've never seen a Toyota with six engines, I presume? So another way to think about a Toyota would be as a what I'm going to call a thread. This is my word. And that will be stringing things together. So you'd have one engine. How am I going to draw this? Uh, here we are. I've got no idea what kind of Toyota that is. But. So you've got, you've got one engine. You've got four wheels. You've got one chassis. And you've got an interior. And if we thread together certain elements, we're going to get an example of what that is. So in Buddhism, you have the 32 different kinds of elements of the body, or the four elements. You have the elements of the mind. It's called 52 Jada Sikars. Brightness of mind, dullness of mind, greed of mind, happiness of mind, blah, blah, blah. Lots of different elements. But what we do is we thread them together and show what you might get. One of the ways that we do this in Buddhism is called the six senses. So you would have something like the eye, a, a visible form, attention, something like this. These would then make for consciousness, and this makes for contact. So this would be something like a thread that we're stitching together one of the senses, one of the th things that you can see, plus attention onto it. And this would stitch all these together, certain elements, and you get an experience. Right? That would be one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at things is what I'm going to call, I've already written it over there, is a process. There are a number of other different ways to look at things, but um, I won't go into them. Process. So rather than this is what a table is, we want to see, well, what's the process, the A, B, C, D, E, that's going to go on when an object is presented to consciousness, right? Now, I think, still no questions? Still all quite happy here so far? <laughs> Do you want to change it around a bit and I'll show you some examples of gestalt and objects? Okay, so we can turn on the computer, bring down the screen. I won't need this side of the board anymore, this side we can still see. <clears throat> so I can show you a few examples because What's most important with an object is you have the physical side plus mental. Makes for an object. And this is very important for Nama Rupa, which is the topic of the talk this evening. If we can turn out this light here, it might help people to see. Is that possible? Anybody who knows the layout of the light switches? Uh, so by the, this is the system, that the way it's usually presented. Around the edge here are certain pictures. Here, I'm not sure how clearly you can see, but is a blind man. And that is uh, ignorance. Here there's a potter, and that's bringing things together, and what I've called action. There is a lot of discussion on the word sankara. What does it mean? I'm not going to go there this evening, but I, I do accept there are a lot of different definitions that you can make. So this is the, the 
12 links. It's called The Wheel of Becoming. And this is uh, samsara. This is where we are trapped in this wheel of samsara. So I want to show you an object. And I want to show you how the physical and the mental come together in a single presentation. And my favorite example of all time, this guy. <laughs> Anybody seen him before? Nobody? There must be some people have seen He's got a name. He's called Grumpy Cat. <laughs> this is a real cat. This is not photoshopped. Right? Sometimes they make his eyes squint down a bit. They photoshop his eyes, make him look a bit even more angry. But he's an actual real cat. And they, I just read that they're making a movie of him. He's going to star in a movie. There's a lot of memes out there. If you write anything that you don't like, you put a picture of him there. So right now I would put uh, something like, this is what cats think about the European Union. Because <laughs> I want to encourage Britain to leave the European Union. Uh, so a lot of memes like that. Anything you don't like, you write it down underneath Grumpy Cat. Now, okay, you know you can use your intelligence, you know that that cat isn't grumpy, right? You get that. You get that it's actually just a cat who has a funny shaped mouth. And the cat here is perfectly happy, content with his fame and his fortune and his face all over the internet. Right, you know that intellectually, right? But can you look at that cat and not see it as grumpy? Right? You, it's just almost impossible, right, to separate the grumpiness from the physical thing that you can see. Now this is important because while you're looking at the cat, by the way, this is a gestalt. This is an object that's presenting in your consciousness. While you're looking at the cat, you're not scratching your ear, answering your phone, listening to the traffic. So when you see that form, you have a physical side to it that is the pixels on the screen, but you also have a mental part of the form that is what you know about cats. Maybe you like cats. If you see this, you're like, oh, a nice cat, makes you feel nice. Maybe you think cats are horrible vermin. In that case, I don't want to talk to you. Me, I love cats. But Maybe you dislike cats. So when you look at the cat, you also have a liking and a disliking there that you're not really aware of. You just see a cat. But that is part of the gestalt, part of the object that's presented to you or that you are presenting to yourself, if you like. Uh, you also have the mental state, grumpiness. You can't separate it. You can try very hard but you just can't separate the, that mental side of it. So with every object that's presented to consciousness, it has to have a mental side to it and a physical side to it. Let me give you another example of, uh, this by the way is my thesis, Okay, this one. Okay, this is a very famous uh, presentation of Gestalt. Uh, it's called the Necker Cube. It's a very, very famous thing in psychology. Uh, just look up Necker Cube, the wire cube. Now, which side is the front? Is this the front or is this the back? Raise your hand if you think it's the front. Raise your hand if you think this is the back. Nobody raised their hand yet. You're all a bit nervous. Let's go again. Is this the front or the back? Side. This here? Front? Are you sure? What about this one here? Keep looking. Are you sure? 
keeps changing. <laughs> now you've just seen it switch, right? Now that's the back, this is the front. And what's happening here is any object that gets presented to your consciousness, after a while, like seconds, your mind starts to think of it as gets used to it. And as it gets used to it, it gets less likely to put, be presenting. And then as it does so, at some point, suddenly, snap, and you'll get the other way of seeing it. And then you'll see it that way for a while, and that will dissipate. That's why when I ask you, you're like, it's the front. No, that's the back. And then after about 20, 30 seconds, you're all going, ooh, ooh, right, as it starts to change. Now, this is an illusion, of course. A lot, Gestalt has a lot of illusions. But what it's trying to show, you, show us is how the mind will organize something and present it. You don't see it changing. You see it as snap. Snap the other way. And each snap means that you've changed the object that's presenting into your consciousness. Right? And so you can feel, you can feel this physical and mental thing. There's not many mental associations with a wire cube. Uh, you can feel this snapping and changing as you go. And that's a change of object, a change of gestalt that's happening. You can wire cube, but the actual name of the thing is called Necker. It's called the Necker cube. Yeah, N-E-C-K-E-R. What nobody in this room sees is a two-dimensional surface with lines on it. Right? It's absolutely impossible to see that as what it actually is, which is a two-dimensional flat screen with some lines drawn on it. It will organize without you being able to do anything about it and present to you as a 3D image. The reason for this, like I said earlier, uh, gestalt organization is, des is designed by evolution to be useful for animals. And for most animals, most of the things that we're ever going to interact with are 3D objects. That's why, despite the obvious reasons why it shouldn't be, that's why this will present as a 3D object and not as a two-dimensional object. Most animals will interact with three-dimensional objects. Very rarely will we interact with two-dimensional objects. We're not keeping you up, are we? <laughs> no, you... You're yawning very big, so I was worried that we're keeping you awake. We interact with three-dimensional objects, so we have a predisposition for seeing a three-dimensional object, even when patently there is no three-dimensional object there. Right? So this is the power of gestalt, the power of organization, and how it's presented to you. Here's another good example. <laughs> right? Now you know this is just a carrot, right? The, you, you can't be confused about the fact that this is just a carrot. You know it. But you can't see it as just a carrot. Right? You have to see these two guys hugging. You can't get away from it. This is how it's going to organize into your uh, experience. Uh, here's another one. This is called a, a Vexia picture. Right? Right. So I presume everybody can see the face. Anybody can't see the face? Good. Don't pull your hand up because it means something bad. <laughs> You know there's no face there, right? You know there's no face there. But you're going to see a face. You can't help it. If you apply effort, you can snap the face off and see birds in a tree, right? For most people, 
Well, I ask you, why do you think the face is more obvious when it's got the least possibility? When you're looking at the picture objectively, I mean, there's no face there, right? Why does the face appear more strongly than the birds in the tree? Very common. Right, you're close. What it is, is we interact with faces a lot more than we do with birds and trees. So we have a predisposition to seeing faces in things. I don't know if you have internet here, but I, I can sh there's a very funny crater on Mars. I can show you if we turn the internet on. And there's a crater like that on Mars. So actual real thing, you can go and find it. It's called the Smiley Crater. <laughs> and I swear to you, you look at it and that's a face there. Some conspiracy theorists said that human beings have been to Mars before and have drawn a face on this thing. So uh, it takes an effort. This one will, will automatically organize into a face because you have a predisposition to seeing faces. If you don't have a predisposition to seeing faces, you have what's called face blindness. And there's a very famous, the most famous guy with face blindness in the world, name was Oliver Sacks, and he wrote the book, famous book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Has anybody read that? Must be somebody in this audience who's read that book. Raise your hand, come on, somebody has read it. You saw the cover, okay. Well, you're, you're number one in the class. <laughs> so Oliver Sacks has face blindness, and he cannot recognize a face, even of his wife or children. He can recognize your voice. So if you know him, you know that immediately when he sees you, you say something. You say, hey, Oliver. Even if he's turned around like that and turns back, he can't tell who he's just been talking to. Call face blindness. He can tell if you're male or female, you're young or old, your ethnicity. He can tell all of these things, whether you have short hair or long hair, but he's no idea who you are. They showed him a picture of Oprah Winfrey, and he said, oh, it's Michelle Obama. <laughs> he can't tell the difference. So we do have this uh, automatic program that we, are, we will see faces. You know, in, um, in the computer, on Facebook and WhatsApp and things, you know what that is? Right? A colon and a bracket. I call a bracket. It's actually a parenthesis, but... I'm going to say bracket. That even that will organize into a face, right? Even something that's just as utterly not a face will organize into a face. So, snapping between the face and the birds, if you apply the right amount of effort, this particular picture you can start to snap either way. But you can't see it halfway. It's going to be one or the other. That's because you don't have access to your organization. You only have access to what is presented. And you presented one object, one object, one object, one object. Do I have any more? Oh, I love this one. So, you can presumably guess why I'm showing you this picture. Right? I, th I don't know what it is. What is it, a walrus or something? It doesn't have big teeth. I'm just going to do a little experiment. Okay, so this guy looks like he's laughing, right? You can't see it any other way. It's organizing that way. I'm just going to do a little experiment. Okay, so the, he looked like he was laughing means that you are seeing the physical thing and you have a whole bunch of mental perceptions about it, will organize into one object. I ask you, on the, oh, I better do, better do this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
So I'm going to ask you, on the picture of the animal that was laughing, what was in the background? Was it grass, ice, water, sand, or pebbles? Raise your hand if you think it was grass. Water. Pebbles. Ice. A lot of people not very sure. Uh, what color were the pebbles? Green, brown, gray, brown. Who has no idea what the heck was in the background of the... <laughs> okay, so... Isn't that interesting that only about 10 people have any, it's hard to say that that's pebbles, by the way, but I'll give you that. It, it might be lava or something, I don't know, but pebbles would be the closest. Isn't it interesting that you were looking at this picture for a minute, specifically, put attention onto it, and 90% of you had no idea what the background part of the picture was. Right? It's curious, right? This is what's called, in psychological terms, technical term for you, uh, gestalt term is called figure and ground. Pen's a little weak. You want me to rewrite? Figure and figure and ground is the technical term for it. What it means is this will organize into the figure that you see, the object that's presented to consciousness, while everything else is relegated to background. It's actually not background, it's ground, but eh, it's close enough to say background. Okay, I think we can do last one. Uh, we're kind of finishing this topic now. Oh, this one I do love. Yeah, what do you see? Do you see a hole or a pyramid? Raise your hand if you see a hole. Raise your hand if you see a pyramid. Raise your hand if you can now see both. <laughs> right. It's one of the most cunning illusions. Might take a while, but this might be a rim, and this is the hole down the pipe. Or this might be the side of a pyramid coming up. <laughs> you can go back, look at it on the internet. So, but the, the important thing is you can't see it as a two-dimensional image. It's just about impossible. To see it, what is actually there, a two-dimensional image. You won't see it. But you can snap between one gestalt, one object, or a different object. So this is how one thing at a time is presented to your consciousness. And you might find meditation teachers will say to you, the mind is only aware of one thing at a time. And you will think that's a little bit strange because you seem, you feel like you're aware of many things at a time. This one I quite like. I'm going to do a last, last one, this particular image. Has anyone ever seen this one before? So, for most people, don't read the text, but for most people, you're going to see a dark block on the top and a white block underneath, right? But the color of the two blocks is exactly the same. I can try and show you that, but it's a bit difficult with a projector because um, a projector, I'm looking for something to block it with.
shade right in front of your eyes. These two are actually the exact same shape. But what's interesting is you can see it change, right? What's happening is the organization of your mind is like this, and then it's like, oh, oh, hang on a minute, and it looks be like this. Okay, so, um, I think we can Yeah, we can finish with that. Okay, let's turn off the projector. Okay, so where this all comes into play in Buddhism is in a term, technical term in Buddhism. A uh, mm, technical term in Buddhism that is called Nama Rupa. It's actually Nama Rupa. And this, um, this term is a little bit debated within Buddhism, but I think part of the problem is that when scholars come to Buddhism, they're always working from the details to try and understand the whole picture. And that's why I'm very, very careful to you this evening that I want to show you the whole picture first. That you can see now, right, it should be fairly convincing that your mind will present certain objects to you. And that's the object that you know, the background to it you don't know. And while you're focusing on this object, you're not focusing on other objects. The object, we've got to be careful when we talk about an object, doesn't mean an actual physical object in the world. It means an object that's put together and presented as an object. So a table can be one object, or it can be four legs and a top. A chair can be four legs, a base and a back. You can break it down. So your object doesn't depend on the physical world, it depends on the organization and the presentation to consciousness. So. The, in Buddhism, nama uh, is, I'll use the Pali word, shall I? I presume that you know. Jedana uh, Sanya um, What else is in there? Vedana and Manasikara so, nama is defined by these four terms here. Rupa is, de is defined as form, but here it can mean any sense form. Any sense. Uh, do you want to do an experiment on a different non-visual gestalt? I'm going to make a series of taps on the table and I want you to tell me what I'm tapping. Okay? You have to pay close attention. If you know what I'm tapping, don't call it out. I'll give you an opportunity after I finish to raise your hand if you think you know what I tapped. So what we want to know for all of you who do know what I'm tapping, stay quiet because you want to know if everybody else got it, right? So don't say anything if you know what I'm tapping. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you know what I tapped. One person? Anybody else? You sure? Is your hand up? Anybody else? Two, three, four. Four people. What was it? So who, who raised their hand? Who's got it? Yeah, what was it? 
Jingle bells. Okay, now I'm going to tap again and listen if you can try not to hear jingle bells now. Right? You can't not hear it now. And this is because the Gestalt is organizing the thing for you. When you don't know what it is, your Gestalt is very weak. You're like, eh, eh. But as soon as you find a way for it to organize it, snap. That's going to be how you see it. I have another one if you want. Afterwards we can do it. It's a song that somebody wrote. And when you play it backwards, you get yum, 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 ba, ba, ba. But when you put words underneath the song played backwards, you can suddenly hear words. And it's all about Satan and evil. So people thought this was a hidden satanic message in the song. It's just coincidence. Okay. <clears throat> so what is an object in Buddhism? An object is called a nama rupa. Uh, not just in Buddhism, but also in pre-Buddhist uh, Indian philosophy or uh, Brahmanic uh, philosophy, nama rupa meant, nama actually meant uh, something like concept and rupa meant something like appearance, something like that. I'm not an expert in this field, so no questions about that, please. Uh, in Buddhism, this was, and then this here was called pasa. So what this means is uh, intention. And intention is quite simple in Buddhism. It means intention towards or an intention away from. So it's whether you're going to go for it or come back. Sanya, perception. Cats, you have a perception of cats, right? You know what a cat is, you know how to interact with it. Uh, Vedana, which is whether you like it or dislike it, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. And Manasikara is attention. If you don't put attention onto it, it will not form into an object for you. Sometimes your attention is forced onto something. And sometimes you can guide your attention. So attention can come from top down or bottom up. For example, if somebody at the back of the room right now uh, shouts, free $100 bills for anyone who wants one, right? That's going to grab your attention. You're going to turn around and look at him, and my talk is finished. <laughs> right? <clears throat> it's going to grab your attention. On the other hand, your attention can be guided, right? If you wish, you can look at me now. If you wish, you can turn your attention to a poster or a sign or the person next to you. So attention can work from what we call top down or bottom up. Sometimes you can place attention deliberately, sometimes your attention is going to be taken away. What's actually happening is your mind will, is aware of everything, but the, of all of that everything, it will organize quite naturally and snap into certain objects. So this Namarupa was what we call an object what I've been talking about as a Gestalt object uh, is a, in Buddhism, it's called a Nama Rupa. I, I might say that I'm probably the only person that's really going to say this to you. Other people will have different definitions. This is the actual definition of Nama Rupa. That's not up for debate. But what this means is up for debate, right? We can agree on what the Buddha said, but we can disagree on what he meant by what he said. Right, it's different. Yes. Pasa is, uh, yes, I didn't say, is contact. And I put it in the middle here because this is the mental side, this is the physical side, and this is the contact. Yes, it means it's a thread, if you like, that's stitching this whole thing together into one thing. Think of it that way. Has anybody seen The Life of Brian? Movie, yes? No? Life of Brian is a classic movie. You've got to see this movie. It's a spoof 
about religion and the Catholic Church tried to have it banned. And they said to Monty Python, who wrote the movie, they said, this is a commentary, an attack on Catholic religion. And the Monty Python said, team said, absolutely not. This is an attack on all organized religion. In the movie, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, very famous teaching by Jesus. And he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the cheesemakers. And in the movie, it snaps to somebody at the back of the audience. Blessed are the cheesemakers. What's so special about cheesemakers? And the guy next to him says, well, maybe it's not just cheesemakers. Maybe it's uh, sellers of all dairy produce. <laughs> it's my favorite clip. What this means is we can agree on what Jesus said, but even while he's saying it, we can disagree on what he means by it. And this is the problem of all religion, of all philosophy of any kind, that we will disagree on what we think was meant by what was said. So when Maitreya Buddha comes back to earth, I plan to be there, I've made a resolution, and I'm gonna go up to him and I'm gonna say, right, the Buddha before you, he said this, and what did he mean by this term? Sankara, we've been debating this term now for 2,500 years. I have a whole list of questions for him as well. Should Britain really leave the European Union? <laughs> so we have a figure and ground now, as alongside the Namarupa, you get consciousness. Consciousness arises with the object and ceases with the object. This is an absolute uh, key principle to Buddhism. Consciousness is not a field that you have that's always there. The English word consciousness means, how are we doing for time, by the way? Quarter to nine. Uh, the English word consciousness means something like a field that you have all the time, except maybe in deep sleep. And then when you wake up in the morning, your consciousness is like, very small. And you get up, you clean your teeth, and then you get your coffee, and then your consciousness gets bigger. And then when you get to work, your consciousness almost disappears again. <laughs> until five o'clock, and then you can go home, and your consciousness reawakens on a Friday afternoon. This is how the Romans conquered Britain, do you know that? Romans were very sneaky when they conquered Britain because they attacked Britain at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So for two hours there was this great big battle and then the English are like, right, Friday five o'clock guys, we're off home. And then they came back on Monday morning and the Romans had already conquered Britain. I think that was very unfair. <laughs> Some people have no idea what I'm just talking about. <laughs> so uh, consciousness is not a field that you have that things come in and out of. According to Buddhism, consciousness is the thing that are, is the knowing of the object. So you put your attention onto the grumpy cat, that's your object, and there is a knowing of it. So consciousness arises with the object and ceases with the object. According to Buddhism, every kind of Buddhism has this philosophy. So you don't have a long consciousness that you have your whole life. You don't have a consciousness that passes from life to life. Consciousness arises and ceases with the object. That's why I've translated vijnana uh, This is always translated as consciousness. Now I, I'm translating it as cognition because cognition suggests consciousness of a thing. Uh, however, I'm in a minority of choosing this word. So I should say this is usually translated as uh, consciousness. Okay, last thing before we wrap up is this process then uh, in good gestalt form. We're going from the big thing to try and understand the details. And so the details are like this. Remember this here is keyword process. And process is only one way to analyze experience. There are other ways to analyze it. In this particular way, we're looking at process like A, B, C, D, E, F. Now, 
just because things are arranged in a sequence doesn't mean they have to arise in that sequence. For example, how did you come here today? Train, car, bus? By car, okay. So you came on car by car, that means you depended on your car to come here, right? What came first, coming here or using your car, right? Did you come here first or use your car first? You're like, well, you can't really say, can you? I mean, did you have to use your car? You could have walked or taken a train or taken a bus. So in Indian philosophy, there are different kinds of dependence. You depended on your car, but it wasn't necessary. However, for you to engage in this talk, I'm necessary. So you're depending on me, but there is no choice in that dependence. So it's a different kind of dependence, right? I'm a necessary dependence, your car is a non-necessary dependence. And you can't always say what sequence things came in. Certainly coming here and using your car pretty much happened at the same time. You can't really say which comes first, but one of the, those two things came before seeing me. So when we talk about dependence, sometimes we can switch. And sometimes things, no, that has to happen before this happens. So what happens is these two here, I call the object formation. This means you have the nama rupa and consciousness of it. You have the object and awareness of the object. You can't say which comes first, right? The two kind of arise together and cease together. So consciousness and the object, we can just as easily switch these two around and it won't make any difference to the process. So what we have, uh, it's a whole other talk, but just in brief, these two meanings mean, sorry, these two here, ignorance and action, mean before you experience anything, there is a movement of the mind. In philosophy, this is called intentionality. What it means is you cannot love, you must love something. You cannot hate, you must hate something, right? You cannot want, you must want something. So any moment of consciousness that you're ever going to have implies there's a movement of the mind out in some kind of action. Okay, that's a whole other talk. I'll do that for you next year. Uh, <laughs> and that movement of the mind in philosophy is called intentionality. It's got nothing to do with what you intend. It's a confusing word. It doesn't mean I intended to make Britain better by joining the European Union, but I failed and Britain got worse. That's intention. This means strictly this process of seeing an object. Your mind has to move first to engage. If your mind doesn't move, there's no engagement, there's no object, there's no consciousness, according to Buddhism. So a little complicated. Uh, by the way, there are three kinds of action, meritorious, demeritorious, and stationary. Uh, those of you who know Buddhism, stationary means jhana of the different kinds. So what this actually means is in order to get enlightened, you have to stop moving. But stopping moving is not concentrating on an object. That's a very key point to enlightenment. Anyway, we're going to skip past that. It's a whole other talk. Very often in this process, these two are missing. Very often there are nine links or eight links, sometimes there's 24 links, sometimes this one isn't there, but there's a different word there. So it's very flexible in the way the Buddha used it. And that's why I think we can apply the general idea rather than trying to understand term by term by term. The general idea is, Every moment of consciousness that you have is focused on an object. One object after another object after another object. This is the monkey mind that swings through the forest. Understanding that process, whenever you have an object that comes into consciousness, 
This will activate your sense, that particular sense door. You get a feeling of contacting that object. When you contact something, you're going to like it or dislike it. You're going to be drawn towards it or away from it. You can have neutral feeling, but very few human beings operate in neutral feeling, right? If I was to monitor your conversations with people, do you talk about the kind of food that you like to eat, the kind of politician you don't like to listen to, Donald Trump doing this this week, I don't like it, or do you talk about the neutral feeling in your earlobe, or do you talk about uh, what do you think about the the boxer Anthony Joshua, you're like, I don't care about boxing or Anthony Joshua. You don't talk about things that are neutral. So even though neutral feeling is possible, 99.9% .9 of a human being's life is based on things that you like and dislike. Because of liking and disliking, you get craving, you want to get it, you want to get rid of it, you get hyped up about it. And because of this, you have attachment. What did I go? Clinging. Uh, a better word is attachment. You form attachments to things. And because of attachments, this means that your consciousness gets engaged in an activity. Again, another Dharma talk, but... Or actively engaged, conscious engagement with something. So, for example, on Saturday afternoon, I'm going to be very excited. I don't get excited about many things. But on Saturday afternoon, there's a terrific boxing match. The two best female middleweight boxers in the world, both of them fabulous boxers, and they're going to be fighting on, here I am, a man of peace, teach meditation, how to calm your mind down, and then get the boxing on, yeah, get all. I have no excuse. I used to hide these things, now I don't care. I like boxing. <clears throat> so <laughs> what's going to happen is I'll be ready for it. I'll be waiting to place my attention onto this object. When I see it come on, boom, my attention is going to be in that TV screen. <clears throat> my eye sense is engaged. My mind sense is engaged. I'll have the contact with the boxing match. I like it. I really want to see it. I really want the German girl to beat the American girl. <laughs> she's a better boxer, but she's not as tough. So this is a really good match. So I have craving. You can see I'm already craving it, right? But think about it. While I was talking about the cat that was grumpy, the boxing match wasn't in my consciousness, right? So I wasn't craving it. Unless people miss, this is very important for Buddhism, because if something's not there in your conscious attention, it's not causing suffering. And the whole of Buddhism is about suffering, arising of suffering, and the end of suffering. So the only thing that you can suffer over is something in conscious attention. Freudian psychologists here will disagree with that, and you have a point. I can argue against it. What I'm saying is, in this model of Buddhism, that's how it works. So I have my clinging, my attachment to boxing, my attachment to the two women who will be fighting, uh, the nasty American and the nice uh, German. Uh, she's nice looking, she's uh, physically uh, a beautiful athletic specimen. Uh, she has beautiful boxing skills. Whereas the American is just a banger, tough banger. Do you want to know more about, we can finish with the Dharma talk and just go on to boxing if you like. <laughs> then what happens is I get conscious engagement with that thing. So in Buddhist terms, and this is directly from the Sutta, what, there's, what is the Buddha himself said, consciousness gets stationed in the activity. So my mind goes to that, and then object after object after object, but I'm engaged in that activity. And it's our tendency as human beings to always be engaged in an activity that will cause us to be reborn. How does this work? Well, if I'm on my computer, 
the one thing that really sucks me in more than any other thing is Photoshop. I am a demigod on Photoshop. I'm pretty... <laughs> Some people have no idea what I'm talking about, and I'm glad you do. When I get engaged in Photoshop, hours will go by, and I'm like this. It's like a kid playing a computer game, but I'm doing Dharma posters usually. Then my consciousness is in that, and what will happen, that's my consciousness being engaged in activity. Then what will happen is I'll suddenly remember myself, and ah, and then I'll realize you know, my back's aching because I've been hunched over the computer. And I'll be like, yeah, I really need a cup of tea because I'm English. So I get up. Now I've changed my activity from Photoshop. Now it's going to make a cup of tea. Second activity. When I get my cup of tea, I'll be like, right. Uh, oh, better check Facebook, email, get my cup of tea. That's another activity. And then I might say, you know, I'm ready for my nap. So then I get engaged in another activity. So this one, bhava, means a, a, a longer term activity that you get stationed into. And it's our habitual tendency to always get stationed in certain activities that when we die and we are reborn, this will propel us into taking a rebirth. How that works, I can't tell you. I can't remember my last one. I hope my next one is a long, long way away. <laughs> and because you get born, you, you're going to die, get old, suffer and die in future lifetimes. So, that's it. The gestalt, the whole picture. Uh, remember, we're working from a whole picture to understand the parts, rather than looking at the parts to understand the whole picture. Object after object after object is presented to consciousness and propels us into this process that never stops until you're enlightened. <clears throat> So, that's a good moment to stop and take questions. Anybody got any questions? Just wait for the microphone down here. Down here, the mic, down here. Um, so actually you gave us a solution to non-suffering. It's just, don't think about it. No, you, suppose <laughs> something is, Causing you to suffer, you just don't pay attention to it. I like that. <coughs> and don't, you don't, don't bother with Buddhism and meditation. I just don't think about it. Yeah, <laughs> you said it once it's not in your consciousness, you don't suffer. Yes. So that's but the best way. Yeah, don't yeah. study Buddhism. No, I'm kidding. I should say, though, this, this idea that you can only suffer over something you are conscious of is up for debate. That's how it's presented in this model. But there are other models in Buddhism, you might debate that. Uh, certainly in psychology we would debate that, but that's how this model works. I actually think this is right, but I do accept there are debates. The problem is, how do you not move the mind? As a human being's mind, we are so used to always engaging with something that we don't know how to turn it off. And if you try to turn it off, what happens is you fall asleep. And this process actually is still carrying on while you're asleep. You're still getting consciously engaged in that of being asleep. So how do you do that? That's what meditation is about. The reason we look at this process is because in, med in meditation, you can do this. You'll be sitting there meditating, right, I'm going to watch the breath, I'm going to just be here, I'm going to watch the breath. I'm going to write, watching the breath, what's for dinner, uh, what am I going to eat tomorrow, how am I going to get there, how am I going to do my visa for Thailand and blah, blah. And then you, ah, oh, I got caught up in stuff, come back. <sighs> <sighs> right, now I'm ready. You just can't stop that process. But when you watch that process, always involves a kind of suffering. Not existential suffering, what they call beating of the breast and crying of the eyes. But a suffering is in the mind is condensed around something. So the mind going back to the mind itself, this is how one of the great Thai Ajans 
described it is enlightenment. Now I can't, not being enlightened, I can't tell you what it's like to be enlightened. I can't tell you what it's like not to have this process be going on all the time. But I do know that in meditation you catch your mind going out to something, back, catch your mind, bring it back. And at some point the mind just snaps back and you're there, bright, clear, present, aware, but your mind isn't moving onto anything. And it's beautiful. The mind is very, very bright, very, very still, and you, you have the insight, this is the path. Yeah. So yeah, there will be a, a non-movement, but uh, yeah, it's a difficult thing to do, and it's not just not thinking of something. But I do get this thing, you know, there's some things that I really don't like in this world. I don't want to use Donald Trump as an example every time. Um, but there's some things that I really don't like. I used to work as a chef a long time ago. I got this job by accident and I loved it. And we had this boss who was a real idiot. He was just, he was a German. I don't know if that's relevant. <laughs> and he's just, he's just like, and almost every day I go back thinking, oh, that idiot. I get up in the morning, I'm like, oh, that idiot. Right? But then, if I don't think, oh, that idiot, I don't suffer over it. After a while, I was walking down to work thinking, oh, that idiot's going to be there. Well, I'm just making myself suffer over it. And I was in this beautiful town in the south of England, and I'd gone there specifically. All the buildings are falling down, and you're not allowed to repair them and these old windows and flower boxes and seagulls everywhere. It's just beautiful. And I'd gone there because this town was beautiful. And I'm walking along thinking about this idiot manager. I'm like, well, what if I just don't think that? So I look around and I'm like, oh, these birds and the flowers, this beautiful town, Dartmouth, if ever you've been there. It's just the most fabulous town in the south of England, in the English Riviera. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but... So yeah, I just put my mind onto something else and then I'm not going to suffer over that guy anymore. And then when... Then uh, what, what I found was, actually he's not that bad. When I stopped complaining about him, he was actually all right. He told this really funny joke and then my opinion of him was like, actually you're quite cool, I like you now. I don't think I'm going to tell you the joke, it's a bit... Mm. Anyone else have a question? Also, I'd like to know, is, it, is what I talked about clear or not clear? Is it um, not relevant to Buddhism, you think? Or is it, you know, have I made a mistake somewhere? Uh, is it helpful or not helpful? The one valid feedback is, do we need to know anything about psychology in order to understand Buddhism? To my view, yes, this helped me to understand this. When I originally made those CD-ROMs, this is what I had to go on, and it took me you know, months to try and fishing out all of these meanings. And even then, it was still blurry in my mind. And when I came across Gestalt, I'm like, oh, well, that's what's happening. Right? Now the whole thing can snap into a clear organization, like, oh, it's, it's quite straightforward, really. Oh, thank you, Bhante. So my question is, uh, we, we need to have Nama Rupa, then we have this consciousness. consciousness. So where is my Nama Rupa when I'm in a deep sleep or in a coma? So what's your experience when you're in deep sleep or in a coma? I don't know if you've been in I a don't coma. Exist. Um, when I was very young, I got into some alcoholic comas, maybe. Um, but that's the point. We can't say what is your experience when you're in a coma or deep sleep, because we can't report it. According to the texts, we have what's called bhavanga. And bhavanga is what you are aware of when you're not aware of anything. But it's poorly defined in Buddhism. It only appears in later texts. So it's really difficult to say. What, what do you experience when you're in, deep, in really deep sleep or in a coma? I, I don't know. So I was just wondering if you don't know where, if I don't exist when I'm deep sleep or in a coma, and if I die, am I 
do I still have that craving or the into being at that stage? Right. <coughs> you know, I, I have this thing with um, anesthetics. When I have a general anesthetic in hospital, fortunately I'm very healthy, I've had very few operations. Uh, but I did have all my teeth out by general anesthetic and they use gas and the gas used to sleep. Um, there's a weird thing, every time they put me to sleep, if I'm put down for 30 minutes, I'll stay asleep for three hours. And if they put me down for an hour, I'll stay asleep for five hours. And I always forget to tell the hospital, mainly because I'm terrified when I'm going in and I forget. And it's a big deal. Anesthetic is a dangerous thing, actually. People die coming out of anesthetic. So when the hospital sees that I'm not coming around, they're like slapping me in the face, shaking me, shouting questions at me. And I hate waking up, boy. It's like, just leave me alone. They ask you questions to see if your mind's working, like, wake up, wake up, what do you do for a living? I'm like, an astronaut, leave me alone. My theory is, while I'm in deep unconsciousness, I like it. I'm convinced that I really like being totally oblivious. So I think you do have awareness while you're oblivious, but you're not making memories. So when your ego re reawakens afterwards, it can't remember what was being experienced. That's my theory. As for death, um, the, the Buddha didn't really talk about it, but some saints and sages have talked about it. And what they say is that when you die, you will get very bright. You can't not be present for it. It will wake you up. So you can't die being unconscious, because when you die, you're going to wake up and be present and awake and aware. That's what they say. Um, I can't answer the question from my own experience. Like I say, can't remember the last one. The next one is a long way off it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Bring the microphone. Yeah. We have about 15 minutes total. I just want to say I really appreciate this talk. It's very interesting. Thank you. I've never seen it from a psychological into the Buddhist way of thought. So you wanted to know whether it's relevant. It's highly okay. relevant. Thank okay, you. thank you. I might point out Gestalt is... Uh, I picked Gestalt as my field in psychology because nobody has any understanding what it is. And so nobody can argue with me. <laughs> and when I was writing my thesis, which is actually what this is all based on, I wanted to pick something that the teachers and people aren't going to start saying, you know, you made a mistake here. And it worked. Because when I did my thesis defense about two months ago, they were like, okay, you got a B plus. <laughs> and nobody argued with me. That was the point. So I, I should say that um, this is not necessarily a psychological interpretation. This is a gestalt interpretation. And most psychologists don't really know about gestalt. I'll tell you what happened. The three guys who uh, brought this system about, named Wertheimer, uh, Kafka, and Kohler. Kohler, you might have seen, he, he was very famous for doing experiments on monkeys. And he, had, he hung bananas up, high up. And he gave the monkeys a bunch of boxes. And what they have to do is pile the boxes on the table, get the stick, and unhook the, the bananas. Has people seen that? Anyone? You've never? Uh, no, nobody? OK. Won't go there. Uh, so these three guys who really introduced the whole Gestalt theory were all Jewish, and they were in Germany. Uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, and obviously 1935 was not a good time to be Jewish in Germany, so they fled, and when they fled, they went to different places, and the Gestalt school died. Some of the principles now of Gestalt still get used in cognitive science, but as a complete school in itself, it kind of broke up and got dissipated. So, you still see Gestalt appear in different cognitive science 
books and, and lectures, but they just kind of take little snippets. I, I watched this talk today, it's interesting, the one with the song that was played backwards. And this was a guy who's trying, he, he debunks uh, supernatural stuff, crop circles and psychic powers and stuff, and he debunks it. And what he's saying is that things like ghosts or whatever, there's just a gestalt organization that's presented to you. So he's using this for a totally different reason. And that's usually where you find gestalt. So there's not many true gestalt scientists around in the world. So I'm one of few. And the ones who are actually present their work differently. They don't, because you'd have to explain what gestalt is. It took me like, it's not hard, right? But it took me 30, 40 minutes to get you to understand what gestalt is. So, yeah. Okay, anybody else? It was clear as mud, but we covered the ground. The confusion made my head spin round. <laughs> sure. Yes, good point. Oh, you know, like the, yeah. the topic was idealism and materialism at the middle way. Yeah. What I got is a very deep lecture on Gestalt and this stuff, which I still don't know what it's all about, like dependent <laughs> origination. So, but what is the middle path between idealism and materialism? Okay. If you don't mind. So. Thank you, sir. Yeah. In philosophy, this school is called phenomenology. Uh, and phenomenology is um, actually there's a very good YouTube song about phenomenology by the Muppets. You look it up. This is great. Muppets, phenomenology. It's a great song. Phenomenology uh, is a probably it is a s philosophical school that's still very active, more so than Gestalt, but they basically mean the same thing. They were, uh, they both came from the same originator, Franz Brentano, and they both mean the thing that is phenomenologically presented to consciousness. So this means the phenomenon that you are actually aware of. So when we talk about idealism and we talk about materialism and we talk about functionalism and we talk about all different schools of philosophy, what this means is everything is in the head. I'm, I'm putting it very simply because actually that's what it is, but and materialism means everything is physical matter. So phenomenology, so if for example you're aware of the grumpy cat, are you aware of grumpy cat out here? Or is that a representation that's happening inside your head? A materialist will say, no, this is a physical thing you're seeing photons and light going into your eye. Materialism. Idealism saying, no, it's the mind. you may have an eye intact, but if you're listening to sounds, you're not going to see the sight. So idealism means that everything you can be aware of happens inside your head, not outside. Strange philosophical stance. I'm not, I don't like either of these two viewpoints. Phenomenology doesn't make... Uh, doesn't really matter whether something's internal or external. Grumpy cat, I can show you, but you can also remember it, right? Doesn't make any difference. Even if you just remember grumpy cat, that's the object of your phenomenal experience. So phenomenology sidesteps both of these philosophical standpoints. Yes. 
you this know. is the third last thing. It's so, so sorry. But you're welcome. No one else is asking questions. Yeah, so if you, you have questions, just stop me. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so my idea is idealism is like ideals. You know, no. I, no. No, not in philosophy. For, for me. Right. That's why I came. I came because I'm idealistic, you know, ah, naive okay. and idealistic. Okay. So for me, idealism is where you, you believe in... Uh, Love, joy, peace, you know, yeah. justice, all that stuff. You hold and on to an ideal. Right, and materialism is the 60s. Right. Cash, car, condo. Yeah. So what's in the middle of that? That, that is not philosophical, No, right? I mean, when I wrote that the title... That is a common question, yeah. When I wrote the titles, I, was, I mean, I thought up 30 different things, so people but pick them out. But how would you answer this one? If a person is idealistic... If a person is idealistic... How to get the middle path? So he's not stuck in ideals. Right, Neither right. is he the stuck in material. Middle path with How? ideals. How? How? I don't know. Oh, you're the <laughs> teacher. <laughs> you're the wise one, right? Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, idealism can mean that somebody who follows the ideals, in Freudian terms, which is how I would answer things, uh, idealism is a function of super ego. Then I have to explain ego, id, id ego, super ego. Um, it's idealism, that's what it is. <laughs> well, in Freudian psychology, you have a three, three layered um, model of a human being or an animal. You have the id, the ego, and the super ego. And the it is the part of you that wants to get what it likes and get rid of what it dislikes. So a dog or a cat has a strong id. They like to be scratched on the belly. I do too. The um, ego is what mitigates the id. So I, with my students in the university, they all come in late for class. And what they want to do is be sleeping in the morning. But what they do do is come into the class. They're not following what they want, they're following what is good for them, what they've decided they should do. And that's what an ego is. An ego isn't a big ego or someone that likes to puff themselves up. An ego is the wisdom part of your brain that controls your behavior in the face of what you would actually want. Uh, now, superego De ego, by the way, develops later. So young children cry when they're hungry or cold or hot or need to go to the bathroom or poop. Pooping is very important in Freudian psychology. Um, <laughs> truly, I'm not making that up. And so what do you do as a parent? You like, they scream, I'll make you warmer. They scream, I'll give you some food. You scream, I'll poop you. But when they get to six years old, Right? They start screaming, I'm cold. I don't care if you're cold. Go and play. I want food. You get food when I tell you you get food. I want to poop. You can't just poop anywhere. You have to do it in the right place at the right time. So a child at about six years old learns, starts to learn, there are rules to existence that didn't apply when it was one to six. And to a child, the world has changed. You've changed. This is what, um, you know, my favorite topic of all is fairy tales. And in fairy tales, you have a witch, and a witch flies around on a broomstick. What does this mean? Also in fairy tales, you have a fairy godmother, right? What does this mean? To a child, when they're very young, how long have we got? But when they're very young, they have a fairy godmother. They have a mother who just gives them everything they want, who looks after them and nurtures them. But as they get older, their mother splits into two beings. One is still the beautiful mother who helps you and nurtures you. And the other is an evil witch who doesn't like you, who's nasty, who flies around the house on a broom. If your mum's doing stuff in the house, right? She's sweeping up in the house. Sorry for the gender stereotypes, but this is how fairy tales came about. That's the evil mother you want to stay away from. So to a child, to separate this into two characters is perfectly logical. That's why the child will understand a fairy tale. 
And what the big mistake is, is that adults now rewrite fairy tales. I say it was gruesome and horrible. I rewrite a fairy tale about the way that I think the world should be. And you're missing the understanding of why the child understands that fairy tale. And the fairy tale will show them that the nasty mother and evil witch will eventually coalesce back into the uh, fairy godmother. So it gives the child confidence. So this is where the ego, <laughs> so I got into that. This is where the ego comes up. After about six years old, the child has to start to learn the rules have changed. Now you have to control your behavior. And the better you can control your behavior, in the face of what you want, the more successful you will be. The superego comes after that, and it comes is ideals and conscience. So I can steal someone's ice cream as a kid, and I'll get away with it because I'm two years old. When I'm six years old, I steal my brother's ice cream, and I get clouted across the top of the head. The ice cream gets given back to my brother that I stole it from. And as you get older, you get a conscience. Like, even if I can steal something and get away with it, I still won't do it because I have an ideal. Uh, if the superego doesn't work properly, this is guilt. You have guilty feelings. Uh, things like marching off to die in war. I like studying history. 12 million Germans marched off to fight for Adolf Hitler and died. Adolf Hitler was worse for Germans than he was for any other country. Um, that's an ideal. They're going off to war on an ideal, even though it makes no sense. That's what ideals are in superego. But this is another topic um, for next year. <laughs> Last minute then, for anybody who has a question about... Last questions? Gestalt or... Everybody good? Or enlightened. Okay, all enlightened. Okay, so if there's no questions, we'll do transfer of merits before we close the call. <coughs> okay, thank you all for being an attentive audience. Uh, I hope that I imparted something that's useful uh, in your understanding of Buddhist processes. Uh, we'll do the uh, blessing. <coughs> Sabiti o iwajan tu sabharo go ina satumate bhawat wantarayo suki di gayuko bawa abiwa danasi li sani chang wutha pachai hino chataro dhamma wadanti ayuwano sukang Ba lang ba wat tu sabha mangalang, ra kan tu sabha devata, sabha buddha nu bawena, sabha dhamma nu bawena, sabha sangha nu bawena, satha soti, ba wan tu te. Thank you, Bhante, for the wonderful talk.